were in a small town on the Mediterranean called Pestum. Pestum is the Roman name or the Latin name. Before that, it was Greek and it was called Poseidonia. The town was named after the god of the sea, Poseidon. This was a Greek settlement, sometimes called a colony, although it was really an independent, small Greek city. And there were lots of these all over the south of Italy in what historians call Magna Greca, or the Greater Greece. And Greece had colonies in Italy, but also in many other places in the Mediterranean, including what is now Turkey. Pestum contains three fabulously preserved ancient Greek Doric temples, two from the archaic period of the 6th century and one from the classical period of the 5th century. The Greeks, over time, adjusted the proportions of the architecture, the width of the columns, the number of columns on the front and side, always in a search for perfection or ideal beauty. The oldest of the three is dedicated to the goddess Hera, who was the wife of Zeus. This temple, Hera I, has all of the elements that we would expect to see in a Doric temple. It's got massive, heavy columns that have no feet. They go directly into the platform of the temple itself, the stylobite. They rise up with a shallow, broad fluting and end in a very simple geometric capital. In addition, that temple has a kind of exaggerated entasis. The column isn't straight. It bulges towards the middle and tapers towards the top. In this case, is so exaggerated, it makes it seem as if the column is bulging under the weight above. And the capitals also almost seem flattened by the weight of the roof. So there's a real sense of horizontality and of weight in the oldest of these temples. The temple is an interesting deviation. The front of it has nine columns across. And that's a little bit peculiar. Because it's an odd number, you have to walk around that central column. Greek temples were really meant as houses for the gods, not the way we think of a temple or a church as a place of worship. The worship would have happened outside of the temple. But in the case of Hera 1, there's a row of columns right in the middle of the cella, so it's hard to imagine how the cult statue fit inside. Actually, there's a number of different theories about this. Some have suggested that perhaps this was a temple to both Hera and her husband Zeus, in which case perhaps there were two cult statues in the back. But to be honest, nobody knows for sure. There is a lovely sense of balance of the proportion of Hera 1, of this oldest of the three temples. You've got nine columns in the front, down the side, you've got 18, so you've got a very neat geometric doubling. And art historians really like to contrast the older Hera 1 with so-called Hera 2 from the classical period, which is very different in its proportions. It has a much greater sense of verticality, of, of being more slender, of not being so subsumed under the weight of the roof. It's also in many ways better preserved in that we can see the frieze with the triglyphs and metopes and part of the pediment remains. But probably the biggest difference for me between Hera 1 and the so-called Hera 2 is that Hera 2 is much closer to what we have come to expect from a Doric temple, such as the Parthenon on the Acropolis in Athens. This has six columns in the front, so it is symmetrical in the front. There is a gap in the middle that we could walk through, and the side contains 14 columns. This temple, though, has some other kinds of variations. It's got a second colonnade just in back of the first, and then the interior space is defined by an outer wall and then a colonnade that has a second set of columns above it. This seems to be a better solution for supporting the roof than a row of columns down the center that we see in Hera 1. So let's spend a moment really looking at Hera 2 and looking at the changes that have taken place. The columns have a less pronounced entasis. In addition, the flare at the top of the column, at the base of the capital, is not as exaggerated. It's not as wide or as plate-like as it was in Hera 1. And as a result, the structure has a greater sense of lift. But one of the things that's often missing from a discussion of both of these temples is 
the location. All around are even older Greek ruins and Roman ruins. The Romans would conquer this area, would take the entire peninsula of Italy. They would push out the Greeks in the south of Italy and push out the Etruscans in the north. They took this area of Pestum in the third century BCE, so that's when this became Roman. So all around these temples are Roman houses, Roman apartment blocks. There's an amphitheater. So these things literally coexisting. When we look at Heratu, you know, this classical Doric temple, I think it's also useful to think about ancient Greek sculpture that was made at this time, like the Doriferous, or some of the images of gods and goddesses that we saw today in the museum in Naples, or of Greek athletes and heroes. We're at this moment of what was called the golden age of Greece, of Periclean Athens, of the invention of democracy, of humanist philosophy. A culture that at this very moment was inventing the geometry that we still use, was seeking to understand the movements of the heavens, the movement of the human body, was inventing the philosophy that we still struggle with. We're looking at artifacts, at buildings that were created by a culture that profoundly shaped our world. Both of these temples, and the third temple that archaeologists believe was dedicated to Minerva or Athena, all have a sense to me of rising out of the landscape, of giving form to human aspiration 